This just in. Special announcement from the Natasha and Debbie show. What? Special epic pop-up Magic Monday episode tomorrow. That's right. Don't miss out. Set your notifications and be here for this Magic Monday episode. Don't miss it. Call your neighbors, your best friends, your family, your the strangers you don't even know, your exes. Get them together. Whatever you got to do, just don't miss it. Be here. We will. Natasha. Debbie. Show. The show. <laughs> Welcome to it. <laughs> just two patriotic girls. Learning about the world. So please, don't take us the wrong way. So one of the things that we started doing just a couple months back, really, a few mm -hmm. months back, really, um, here on the channel is every now and then we want to learn more about famous uh, British people and some of your favorites. And we've asked we um, have. in different places. And there's been a lot of names put on there, but this one was put on quite a few times. Florence Nightingale. So what do we know about Florence Nightingale? Well, I know she was kind of... Um, Kind of the, the lead of nursing. Yeah, kind of like the mother of nursing. Yeah, is what mother of nursing. Well, we've heard. So we know she's a nurse. Um, I know that she was born in Italy, but I know she was British. Um, and that's our knowledge. That's it. So we're going to be learning a lot today um, and looking forward to that. And uh, before we get going, if you don't mind to hit that like button, we always appreciate it. And consider subscribing. But check out some of our other content. Make sure you want to be a part of our family. Absolutely. So uh, again, we're going to be taking in this video. Uh, look at this video. Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp. I don't know what the lamp has anything to do with no. anything. So we'll learn about that too. Um, and uh, there's there's quite a few videos out there, but some are most of them are really long. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to find stuff that kind of works within the time frame where we can get as much out of this as we can. As always, leave us a comment of things maybe left out. Um, or even someone else you want us to take a look at next. That would be a great idea. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited to learn about Florence Nightingale because I've heard the name my entire life, mm -hmm. but little to, I mean, again, no knowledge really to what that name really means. And it's time for us to to figure that out and learn. And hopefully this video will give us as much detail and information as possible because I have a lot of respect for everyone that works in the health fields, um, all nurses. Um, mm -hmm. th this, the job, I, I've had friends that, that are nurses, you, you do too. Oh, I do. It's such a hard job to take care of people and especially when they're sick. Yes. And so much, so many hours you work yourselves to death. You definitely mm -hmm. don't, it's one of those thinkless jobs, you know, you don't get a lot of people right. that are so kind to you. Um, but we salute you, uh, nurses of Great Britain, of the U S of all the countries watching this video. Mm -hmm. We, we, we know it's not an easy job, not that we've done it, but we, we definitely respect the profession a lot. So without any further ado, let's learn about Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp. Now, if I were to ask you to name a famous nurse, there's a very good chance that you'd respond with the name of a 19th century woman. Florence Nightingale is almost the archetype of nurses. A wealthy woman who gave it all up to devote herself to caring for the sick, she's still pictured today as she was during her heyday in the Crimean War, carrying a lamp from sickbed to sickbed, tending oh, okay. to the wounded. But how many of us know the woman behind the myth? Born into privilege in the early 19th century, Florence Nightingale was a polymath genius who spoke multiple languages and pioneered oh. concepts of statistical analysis that are still used today. Huh. A shy, devout Christian, she was a feminist who thought women shouldn't vote, a celebrity who wished only to be forgotten, and a nurse who oversaw a hospital with one of the highest death rates what? in modern history. Wow. A complex woman full of contradictions, this is the life of Florence Nightingale. Oh, I'm perplexed right now. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Explain to us, Simon. What words spring to mind when you hear the name Florence Nightingale? We're guessing it's something along the lines of nurse or angel and probably lamp. What probably don't spring to mind are words like borderline genius. Born on May the 12th, 1820, to English parents in the city of Florence, no prizes for guessing where she got her name <laughs> there, Florence Nightingale had the sort of brain that only comes along once in a generation. Her parents were super connected, super wealthy English socialites who valued education even for their two daughters. Okay. This was kind of a big deal at the time when being born with two X chromosomes was the quickest shortcut to a life of knitting, wearing 
wearing corsets yeah. and fainting when Very someone true. mentioned long division. Yep. Luckily for baby Florence, her father had always dreamed of passing on his own Cambridge education to his children, and he'd be damned if he was going to let those children, being female, stop him. There's actually some evidence that Papa Nightingale had expected Florence to be a boy, and he refused to accept reality. Uh -huh. He encouraged the villagers on his estates to refer to the young girl by the male title of Squire. Regardless, Florence's <laughs> early life was spent in a blitz of learning that would leave an honor student's head spinning. Huh. She mastered yeah. French, German, Greek, Italian, and Latin. She memorized works of philosophy and would debate them with her father. She also got super into maths to the extent that she begged her parents to let her go study the subject at university, but her mother said no. Really? It was not long after Why? that Florence, she had a vision. Now, we really need to be a bit careful with the word vision here because that conjures, you know, images of Joan of Arc communicating directly with God. Right. Florence's vision, <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was more than anything a bit of a feeling and a certainty that God had given her a silent command. Still, the Gosh. effect, it was dramatic. On February the 5th, 1837, the 16-year-old Florence declared God had told her to end suffering in the world. She interpreted this to mean that she should go into nursing. This time, her mother. She's not gonna end up being like an angel of death, is she? Like a nurse of death or anything? If that's coming up, I would shock me. I yeah, would think not. Would be I would have. We would have known that. We would have heard that, right? I'm I just think saying. So. This is intriguing. Her and her father both told her no. In those days, nursing was considered barely above prostitution. What? The idea that an upper middle class girl could really? go into the profession was mm. so radical that even Florence's liberal father refused to consider it. But if mum and dad thought that they could keep Florence from her calling, well, they had another thing coming. Over the next 13 years, Florence tried again and again to change her parents' minds. In 1844, Florence huh. tried and failed to convince her parents to send her for nurse training in Salisbury. In 1849, she even ditched a long-term suitor, Richard Monckton Milnes, so that she could focus on her non-existent career. By the way, random aside here, it later transpired that this suitor was heavily into sadomasochism, so maybe she kind of dodged a bullet there, maybe. Yeah. But Florence was persistent, and she kept working away at her parents all the way through her teenage years right into womanhood. By the okay. time 1850 rolled around, she was 30 and her father was utterly worn down. That July, her parents gave her permission to travel to Germany for a two-week training course at a nursing hospital. Okay. Perhaps they thought that being up close with all that disease would put her off a life mm. of nursing. But, well, that didn't happen. The next year, Florence returned for another course, this one lasting three months. Okay. By 1853, Florence's dream had finally been realized. Using her family connections, she got a job at a hospital for distressed gentlewomen on Harley Street in London. It wasn't hugely taxing, but it was definitely nursing. Finally, Florence Nightingale had made it. Well, it was just the warm-up act. Florence Nightingale didn't know it yet, but she was about to get sucked into one of the bloodiest conflicts in European history. So just really quickly, if you think about it, like I said, you know, I, I don't know of anything about her life or even her profession, really, but our whole lives, and I, I'm not mm -hmm. speaking for both of us here, we've heard the name Florence Nightingale. We knew she was an, a, a nurse. Right. And we knew it was a positive, you know, thing to hear her mm -hmm. name. Um, so you think about certain people in history, like, what if they never got to be in that profession? You know, exactly. like a Florence Nightingale never became Florence, Florence Nightingale, Nightingale the nurse. <laughs> You know, or um, just, you know, different people in different parts of history. Like, what, how would the world have been so different? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there were people that that did happen with. But, you oh, know, exactly. just an interesting thought. So, the sick man of Europe. Okay, here we go. In 1853, the European continent was haunted by the specter of a sick man. The Ottoman Empire had once been one of the finest empires history ever produced. At its height, it was an epicenter of science and art capable of taking territory all the way up into Austria. By 1853, though, his glory days were over. Huh. Hobbled by stagnation, secession, and wars of independence, the Ottoman Empire was now staggering on the fringes of geopolitics, being known as the sick man of Europe. Okay. As the invalid empire hacked away on its deathbed, another empire sensed an opportunity. In the Russian capital, it was lost on absolutely no one that a dying Ottoman state meant a chance to snatch territory from the empire's fringes. At the same okay. time, in Paris and London, it was lost on absolutely no one that a territory-hungry Russia posed a real threat to all of them. In October of 1853, all these different strands 
well, they finally came together. Under a pretext of defending Orthodox Christians living in the Sikh Empire, Russia made its move. The Turks declared war, which pulled in Britain and France, and suddenly the area around the Black Sea was alight with conflict. It was the start of the Crimean War, and it would end somewhere in the region of a million lives. We wow. could easily spend the next 20 minutes describing this complex forgotten war, but for our purpose today, there are two things that you need to understand about the Crimean War. Okay. The first is that this is the first war in which the modern media was involved. The first war correspondent in history, William Howard Russell, was oh. there for the Times of London, sending back real-time reports okay. for the newly invented telegraph. The second right. is that military hospitals were very different from what we would expect now. Nursing soldiers during wartime, it wasn't something governments did. Since medieval times, it had usually been religious orders like the Sisters of Mercy who took care of the wounded. Mm. When the Crimean War oh. erupted, though, the British government was so against the idea of sending women into a conflict zone that they actually forbid any nurses from going. Really? This meant the injured British troops were receiving a level of care that was so basic you could program computers with it. Oh. Yes, that was a terrible coding pun, and no, we're not sorry. The upshot is that these two points overlapped when William Howard <coughs> Russell decided to write about British military hospitals in Crimea and send back reports so graphic that they caused outrage. Caught back-footed, the British government quickly reversed its no nurses on the front lines policy. Suddenly, Secretary of State at War Sidney Herbert found himself in dire need of a head nurse to send to Crimea. I Luckily, think I that he had is. just the one in mind. Many years earlier, in the 1940s, Herbert and his wife Elizabeth had been visiting Rome when they happened to bump into a vacationing Florence Nightingale. Mm -hmm. The three hit it off and remained close friends when they returned to England. Okay. And so it was in 1854 that Herbert was able to write to Nightingale and ask her to go to Crimea. Florence Nightingale actually jumped at the chance. But at the head of 38 volunteer nurses, the 37-year-old left behind her hospital for gentlewomen and got on a boat on October the 21st, 1854. It was supposed to be a dream come true, a chance to show her parents what she was really capable of. Instead, Florence Nightingale would soon find herself trapped at the center of a nightmare. What? Oh, wow. Oh, that doesn't sound good. On November the 5th, 1854, Florence Nightingale and her corps of nurses arrived at the British military hospital of Scutari, today a suburb of Istanbul. What they found there was something that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. What? The hospital was built atop a sewer, which had flooded long ago, and no one had bothered to plug it. When injured men walked into the toilets, they had to pass barefoot through a layer of ankle-deep Feces. Are you kidding me? Rodents running amok, men lying in filthy bedclothes that hadn't been changed for weeks uh. on end. There was rotting meat lying around from where patients were supposed to cook their meals. There were people with unwashed, gangrenous wounds. Oh, this God. place was a human cesspit, a place where pestilence and disease roamed the hallways, uh. training death in their wake. Wow. The shock was so great that for the first few days, it was all Florence Nightingale could do to keep functioning. The military I'm brass made sure. it clear that after she landed, they didn't want her rocking their stinky, disease-ridden boat. So she tried not to, she really did. This became tricky, though, after November the 10th. On that day, the British wounded of two major battles arrived in Skatari. The hospital, already in dire need of supplies, effectively ran out. It was during this time, when she was surrounded by squalor and misery and the screams of the dying, mm. that Nightingale famously called her new hospital the Kingdom of Hell. But the experience, it gave her the kick up the rear that she needed to keep moving. Remember how we said that France Nightingale was super into math as a teenager? Yeah. Well, she started crunching the numbers for the hospital. To her amazement, she discovered that war injuries had killed around 4,000 people in the hospital that year. Sickness, on the other hand, had killed 19,000. Could you imagine getting thrown in no. that situation? I mean, you, you want to go in and save people, and then mm. I'm sure her vision of what it was going to be like was completely different than what it actually was it's the shock and i just feel for i feel for anybody anybody yeah. living in that condition in those I mean, times yeah yeah i mean it's it's, horrible. that's so just picturing that mm -hmm. oh it's unfathomable and I, i'm just mm. yeah. yeah can't wait to see how she uh helps out here yeah. Some people in the hospital that year sickness on the other hand had killed nineteen thousand. <laughs> this wasn't a hospital this was a charnel house. Soldiers were coming in with treatable injuries, and they were leaving in coffins. Faced with an army determined to keep doing things the old way, Nightingale had no choice but to start trying to save those soldiers herself. This is the part where we get to the legendary image of Florence Nightingale, the nurse walking the wards after mm. dark, armed only with her lamp, okay. offering succor 
to the dying. Wow. Certainly, this happened. Nightingale's nighttime visits became a fixture of the wounded men's lives. But really, this romanticized image is just a sideshow. The important stuff, it was happening behind closed doors. In meetings with army officers, Nightingale insisted on basic standards of cleanliness at Skatari, including regular bathing of patients and changing of bandages on wounds. Okay. At the same time, she campaigned for the open sewer flooding to the lower floors to be repaired, something we're having trouble believing that she actually needed to campaign for at all. Right. Of course, cleanliness right. and closing sewers, it doesn't make good copy, so the newspapers that wrote about the lady with the lamp focused more on her bedside manner. Okay. These were the tales of Florence Nightingale helping the wounded write letters home of the nighttime visits that she made to keep the men's spirits up. Incidentally, the reason Nightingale was the only one to visit the wards at night was because the other nurses were forbidden from doing so. Nightingale thought they would have sex with the male patients, so banned everyone else from roaming around after dark. Interesting. It's just a random historical fact that we really couldn't fit anywhere else. Before long, the men of Skatari had grown to love their ministering angel and the Just one moment, because, I mean, okay, like, hearing that she's already going in and, you know, being with these <coughs> men and this cesspool of disgusting mm -hmm. she's putting her own life at risk you know for all the germs and yes. bacteria and that's on its own level and then she's going and she's saying you know we need sanitation here like mm -hmm. this is and, and yeah the fact that you know, now it's easy for us like simon said to look back and go the fact she had to even say that or ask for it, it's ridiculous right but you know again we look at things like this back in these days with a 2023 mentality exactly and you know the mentality then was different so I am just absolutely blown away and what a credit she was, you know, to finally step up as a woman too in this time when clearly wasn't even wanted and say, hey, this has to happen. I mean, she's saving those those generals lives too. I mean, something happens to yeah, them. And anybody that's injured. This is a this is an amazing, amazing woman. Mm hmm. The British public had grown to love her too. That's right, Nightingale became a celebrity. The tales of her selfless good work were exactly the sort of tales that Britain needed from a war that had produced no heroes. Of course. Right? This reached its apex on February the 24th, 1855. Okay. That day, a London newspaper published an engraving of Nightingale with her lamp. Overnight, this random <laughs> nurse working in a British military hospital became more than just a woman. She became a symbol. The days of Florence Nightingale, the human, mm -hmm. they were over, and the days of Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp, had arrived. Today, the truth of Florence Nightingale has almost been lost to the <coughs> myths swirling around her name, both good and bad. For example, you've yeah. maybe heard of how Skatari actually had a higher death rate under Nightingale, whose reforms were more often than not fatal for patients. This is a tale that's cropped up before on places as venerable as the BBC, oh, really? and it's also likely complete bullcrap. Actual Nightingale scholars like Mark Bostridge are adamant that it's based on a misreading of the data, sort of like how you might look at the way World War II combat deaths spiked after September 1939 and conclude Winston Churchill was the bad guy. Yeah, deaths at Skatari jumped under Nightingale, but that's because she arrived just as supplies ran out and the hospital exceeded capacity. Gotta have now, that's not all to say that the lady with the lamp was always a saint, though. The same time Nightingale was at Skatari around 1855, a British commission looking into sanitation proposed similar hospital reforms to hers. To this day, something Nightingale essentially stole their ideas and passed them off as her own. Then there's the issue of Mary Seacole. A half Jamaican doctoress who used herbal remedies, Seacole traveled to the Crimea under her own steam and set up a hospital on the peninsula to treat sickened officers. Okay. She and Nightingale were aware of one another and didn't like each other very much. There's some evidence Nightingale <coughs> may have refused to let Seacole join her nursing corps due to her race. On the other oh. hand, suggestions that Nightingale took credit for Seacole's innovations don't seem to have much grounds in historical sources. Come 1855, sure. though, Nightingale was a hero of the British Empire. Back in London, a fund had been set up in her name that would eventually raise £45,000, the equivalent to a really giant pile of money in today's yeah, pounds. I, I'd the nurse had also won respect for getting her hands dirty. On a trip to Crimea itself, she had been badly sickened and nearly died. While the papers celebrated her recovery, no one knew that she'd picked up brucelliosis, a recurring infection that would soon leave her badly disabled. Mm. But that was all in the future. Until the war ended, all Florence Nightingale wanted to focus on was caring for her patients. On March the 30th, 1856, and it finally did. The Treaty of Paris was the end of the Crimean War, a mass slaughter that had killed a million, but changed really very little. Those millions that had died, by the way, almost all of them were carried off 
by disease. Mm. After the war ended, That's Nightingale harsh. stayed on in Scutari to help close the hospital before finally departing herself. On August the 7th, 1856, she arrived back in Britain to a hero's welcome. People, they treated her like the second coming of Elvis and Nightingale. She absolutely hated it. As she saw it, the hysteria over the lady with the lamp was just a way of distracting from the real issues. And that was mm -hmm. the reform that the army medical establishment desperately needed. Good for her. Humility is something that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I love dearly. And uh, for someone like herself, you know, who's, you never know how people are going to be. Even today, though, you know, the, the, what's the word I want to use? The image you know, is one thing, and, and I'm quoting somebody, some of you will know, and the person is another. Mm -hmm. And um, But that image can also block the work that you're trying to do, mm -hmm. and I love her for that, that she's like, you know, no, 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 <laughs> let's right. not do this, let's pay attention to what I'm trying to accomplish here, and let's work on that. So, mm -hmm. really just amazing to hear this. Um, I'm very impressed by that. Love the humility that she had. Real issues, and that was the reform that the Army Medical Establishment desperately needed. Right. In the end, she decided that she was just going to have to push through these reforms herself. Go, you. Mm. This is tough. <laughs> In the mid-19th century, if you got sick, there was only one explanation. Miasma. Miasma theory is one of those things you sometimes hear about in history, and they sound so screwy, you almost can't believe people actually thought it was real. I don't know what this is. Basically, people thought that diseases were caused by bad smells. The cholera you might contract from raw sewage yeah, that wasn't that. because of germs, but because of the smell of poo. Not long and before the Crimean War, okay. miasma theory had become so widely accepted really? that the British government actually approved a plan to drain sewage into drinking water because that would be less harmful than letting it pong on the surface. Not really, By the time right? Florence and I Nightingale came along, miasma wasn't the only theory in town. Many medical professionals were sounding alarm bells that maybe this new germ theory was where it was at. But miasma was still the theory British politicians and army medical brass believed. But Florence Nightingale was about to explode all of that about as effectively as a stack of dynamite. After her return home, Nightingale devoted all of her energy and intellect to getting a royal commission established so that she could look into preventable deaths in the Crimean War. But the army, they stonewalled her. So therefore, Nightingale teamed up with government statistician William Barr to provide evidence that something did need to be done. In 1856, statistical analysis was at the cutting edge of modern science. All those lovely, easy to understand charts that you see on Nate Silver's blogs, they simply didn't exist yet. The mm -hmm. fact that they do now is in part thanks to Nightingale and Barr. For roughly a year, the <laughs> two worked to crunch the data by hand. They compared the records of the hospital at Scutari to a London military hospital and then also to a Manchester civilian hospital okay. as a control. The excellent podcast Smart. called Bedside Rounds details this, and really their episode on Florence Nightingale is a great resource for understanding her statistical breakthroughs, so I'd recommend you go check that out. Now, miasma theory suggested the hospital in Manchester should be the worst of all. Manchester in 1856 was a choking, billowing cauldron of stench. It was everything that miasma believers feared. But Nightingale and Barnes' data, well, it showed something very different. The death rates in the Manchester Civilian Hospital were far below those in the London military one. While oh, the yeah, death rates in Scutari right? had initially outpaced even the London hospital, after Nightingale's reforms, it had dropped into second place. A military hospital in the civilized British capital had a higher death rate than a field hospital on the edges of an active war zone. Wow. As Nightingale put it, sanitation in British army hospitals was so bad mm. it was akin to taking 1,100 young men out onto Salisbury Plain each year and shooting them dead. Good Lord. When Nightingale and Barr presented their findings, they did so visually, using what we'd now call a coxcomb graph. It said that this was likely one of the first times in history data was ever presented visually. There's that, that brain. There's that 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 uh, yeah. education that her dad cared so much that you know she was really. It all just comes together as a puzzle. You know, you start off hearing this. You know, her her dad's dreams for his children. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's definitely putting it to work. She's going to use yeah. it, everything she has her her love for people wanting to care for them. Yeah, and then also um, her incredible intelligence. Yes, and we're thankful for that today, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We sure are. And I'm so glad that uh, smell theory. Thing my has asthma. Gone away. <laughs> I've never heard of that in my life, but uh, no. And that's huh. easy to make fun of it now because now we know. But of course, making fun of it, I was just surprised. Then, yeah, yeah. Back then, they didn't know. No. To understand. When the government saw her graphs, Nightingale 
was vindicated. A major review of army medical standards it was undertaken with sweeping effect. The reforms the Lady with the Lamp had first started all the way back in Scutari were mm -hmm. implemented across the board, including methods for cataloging disease and death rates that were still in use well into the 20th century. Wow. By the time the British Army intervened in China's bloody Taiping Rebellion in the early 1860s, Florence Nightingale's recommendations had so taken root that the death rate for soldiers from disease was 90% lower than it had been in the Huge. Crimean War. For Nightingale, this was a major triumph. The last Thank half you. decade of her life had been consumed with forcing army medical culture to change, and now here she was directing those changes. But there would be no time for celebration. Uh. In 1857, Nightingale suffered her first collapse due to the brucelliosis infection that she'd picked up okay. in Crimea. In no time at all, the disease had emaciated her. She lost all her hair, she lost weight, oh, wow. she became effectively bedridden, often suffering pain so acute that she was unable to work. Oh, for the rest of her life, Britain's most famous nurse would live in agony. Ah. Poor thing. The irony is horrible. Mm-hmm. I'm so sad to hear that. From a physical standpoint, that was pretty much it for Nightingale. After coming down with her illness, she retreated to bed and she never really left. But while she'd never again go as far away as Crimea, the polymath nurse wasn't done yet. In fact, she was just getting started. What? Confined to her bed, Nightingale started writing letters, hundreds of them, thousands of them, campaigning letters going out to all corners of the country, outlining the need for major medical I'm gonna reforms. Cry. I'm gonna cry. And that's not all she did. Remember how people in Britain raised £45,000 yeah. for her while she was in Scutari? Well, Nightingale took that money and used it to fund a secular nursing school, St. Thomas's Hospital, in London. The Nightingale School wasn't the first nursing school in Britain, but it was the first that fulfilled three strict criteria. One, it was secular. Two, it developed its program in line with scientific advances. And three, it treated nursing as a career. No longer would nursing be something for nuns and the lower classes. Nightingale wanted to make nursing wow. a legitimate profession. You can see she succeeded just by looking around you today. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, those who've seen... So now we were right about hearing the yeah. mother of nursing and having that... No that in our heads, um, brava. Yes. Brava. I mean. Thanks to her for all the work she's done. And she's and laying there in bed in agony, you know, and, and, and I, I, wow. And not giving up. She's still working. She's still fighting for her cause, doing whatever Thousands she can. Of letters. It's amazing. What an and incredible woman. I just want to take a moment to say thank you to anyone in the medical profession and their nursing yes. career. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Nursing as synonymous with prostitution as strictly stupid, horny men with a tragic thing for uniforms. But this mm. is where it all started. Nightingale School was the first to give nurses good pay, sick leave, and annual vacation. Fantastic. Perhaps most importantly, though, the school encouraged nurses to travel, to set up schools in other countries, and to pass yeah, the message yeah. on. Within a few years, Nightingale nurses had fanned out across the British Isles. A few years after that, they were establishing schools in America. A few years after that, they were even setting up hospitals in Japan. As they went, nice. the Nightingale nurses took some core tenants with them. Nurses should be separate doctors, rather than merely subordinate. They should enforce cleanliness and the washing of wounds. And healthcare mm -hmm. should be available for everyone. If you live in a nation with universal healthcare, it may well be in part thanks to Florence Nightingale. From her bed, the great medical reformer tirelessly advocated for equal treatment of the poor by nurses and doctors. It's this belief that eventually evolved into Britain's modern NHS. Of course, there was more to Nightingale's last years than just medicine. She became the first female fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. She advocated for minority rights across the British Empire. She also wrote one of the key texts of 19th century feminism, Cassandra, a book <laughs> detailing how intelligent women are often ignored by less intelligent men, which, unfortunately, Unfortunately, it still seems pretty relevant. Yeah, it but does. perhaps the most interesting thing about Florence Nightingale's later life is how private it was. Famously prickly, the now elderly lady with the lamb hated receiving visitors. She hated having her picture taken. She hated huh. being reminded of her fame. Towards the end of her life, she declared, I only want to be forgotten. Huh. And she changed wow. her will to stipulate that she should not have a public funeral. Finally, really? on August 13th, 1910, she breathed her last. Ah. Yeah. For the British public, it was like a symbol of the nation had been lost. Can Despite imagine. her pleas for a private funeral, people lined the road all the way to Nightingale's final resting place. Government ministers made speeches at a special service at St Paul's Cathedral. Ah. Although Nightingale had specified that she wanted to be buried in an anonymous unmarked grave, really? she was finally put to rest beneath a headstone bearing her name at St Margaret's Church. Today the legend of Florence Nightingale, it's still going strong.
She's endured as a symbol in a way that few ever will. Every year, nurses still carry lighted lamps into Westminster Abbey in London <laughs> to mark the passing of the lady yeah, with the lamp. Awesome. It's a touching ritual. It's poignant. There's mm -hmm. also something Miss Nightingale probably would have hated. I was just Florence Nightingale, she didn't want to be remembered. She didn't want to have <coughs> lamp like processions and YouTube videos about her life. She simply wanted to vanish, to be anonymous. <laughs> but sometimes, someone lives a life so great that forgetting them simply isn't an option. Mm -hmm. When Florence Nightingale was born, women were considered incapable of understanding concepts like statistics. Nursing was considered unsuitable mm -hmm. for middle-class girls. Being healthy meant not sniffing smelly air. The fact that Florence Nightingale was able to not just challenge all of these assumptions, but help overturn them explains why she's remembered today. Yeah. Born into a world with a glass ceiling so low it's practically a cage, Nightingale yeah. managed right. to smash through it, and in doing so, she changed the world. She may have been a living legend who wished to be forgotten, but she was also something else, a symbol for both the wounded and the dying, and those who wished to tend for them. She was, if nothing else, the lady with the lamp. I am so moved by her, her life. I am moved yes. um, and thankful. And and also, you know, so I have questions um, that no one can answer, but for her specifically, I mean, like Simon said, there are people in, in, in this world that, you know, may want to be forgotten. You can't mm -hmm. forget them. And I don't think we should. However, you know, like she wanted an unmarked grave. But should she not have gotten what she wanted? I'm just saying, what would have been better for her memory? What would be better for her memory, though? To give her what she wanted or what we wanted? It's just a conversation piece. That's all. I'm not saying mm -hmm. what, what that was wrong. I'm not saying there is a right answer. Sure. It's just things like that. I always wonder that, too. Mm -hmm. Um. And just kind of like, why do you think she really just wanted to not be remembered? Because what she did mattered so much. And maybe that is what it was. Maybe it's as simple as she just wanted to work the work. And, yeah, and the work to stand alone. Yeah. And, yeah. and I respect the, the crap out of mm -hmm. that. What an incredible life. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, to go from uh, her upbringing being so wealthy and yeah. then wanting to go into... Uh, nursing that was looked upon as like prostitution yeah, and, which and I didn't was know absolutely that. nothing at the time. And then to turn it into something that, that, that it is today. <laughs> yeah. That it is today that people yeah. are proud of that uh, flourish. The whole profession has, uh, gets immense respect. Uh, it's amazing. And her life that she just continued, she just didn't give up. She just kept going even when stuck in bed. Absolutely. I, exactly. I was just going to mm -hmm. say what an uh, inspiration she was at her, the end when she was going through so much. I'm so thankful we watched this video. Um, this was just incredible to learn about her life. And, you know, I wish I'd known this before. But mm -hmm. hey, that's what we're here for. We're here to learn. Um, and, you know, what we don't know is what we're here to find out. And this is incredible. I can see why Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp, yes. is so many people's um, favorite British uh, citizen, British mm -hmm. person. I, I'm sorry, you know what I mean. Um, I can see why that that's the case, and I can. It's just incredible that she made such impacts in so many different ways too. And, oh, and just huge. we're we're all wow. I'm sorry, I'm like kind of at a loss <laughs> for words. You guys, like this video if you liked it, um, and please consider subscribing to the channel. I'm so thankful we did this. Amazing. I really am. I really am. And if am. you have anyone else that you would like us to take a look at, please drop the name in the comments and we yeah. will take a look at and it. And if there are other facts too, oh, sorry, um, other facts about Florence oh, Nightingale yeah. that, that Simon left out, which we're, we're sure there are, please let us know more. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate you. And don't forget tomorrow, Magic Monday special episode. So we hope that you'll be there with us tomorrow. For That's our right. Special don't episode. miss out. It's going to be fun. Yes, we got a, we got a happy fun thing for you tomorrow. So until then, guys, please, as always, love like jazz. Be as strong as Tyson. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.